Hi, I'm Rod Hughes, and today I'm joined by Kieran Ponday, Special Practice Leader with LAM Insurance Services. Kieran, thanks for being with us today. Today's topic will be cybersecurity, what it looks like, how it happens, and what nonprofits can do to better protect themselves from becoming victims of malicious computer hackers. Kieran, what does a cybersecurity breach look like? Or more importantly, what does it not look like if the hacker is operating uh, in the background of the organization's systems? A cyber breach could potentially uh, not look like anything at all, or it could be very apparent to you depending on uh, what scheme uh, or means the hacker is using to infiltrate your network. Uh, I like to divide cyber into two big categories of types of breaches that you could see. Uh, the first being extortion and ransom type breaches. In these types of breaches, the hacker has uh, infiltrated your network with something that they're hoping you won't notice. Um, and they're trying to gather enough data that they feel like they can send you a demand that you'll take seriously. Um, so in that scenario, you won't know uh, typically until they do uh, send you their demand and that may just pop up on your computer. Uh, you may get a phone call. There's a few different ways that that could take place. Uh, the second big category of cyber breaches would be uh, more run-of-the-mill cyber theft or funds transfer fraud. And in these types of schemes, the hacker is really just looking to uh, make one theft and be on their way. And so typically, they're not making that much of an attempt to hide their presence, just enough that you don't know for one transaction. So it could be uh, manipulating the account number on an invoice that you're about to pay. Uh, and then as soon as you pay the wrong party, they're out and they don't try to do it to you again. But of course, you realize they took your money. So those are the two scenarios we see most often. And uh, to that end, you may not necessarily know whether someone's in your system or you may know right away. And what makes a nonprofit organization a preferred target of hackers? We find nonprofits are very good targets for hackers because of how much of their data is publicly available and easy to get online, even for the hackers. Um, so things like uh, a nonprofit's balance sheet, their income statement, and even what some of those items on their balance sheet are, such as how much cash they have that's readily available, uh, their investments, what might not be readily available to, to pay a ransom. These are things that the hackers can very easily uh, wrap their heads around, and that allows them to size a ransom demand that's painful enough uh, that they get what they want, but not so painful that the organization goes out of business. And does lack of a more robust IT infrastructure make more make nonprofits more vulnerable? I would say certainly we, we tend to find that there, there is a, a lack of a robust IT infrastructure for a lot of the smaller nonprofits. Of course, there are exceptions, but um, it's just something that we found in the past, and it, it certainly is something that hackers are aware of. And phishing, malware, ransomware, social engineering, we've all heard of them. Uh, they're part and parcel of most cyber breach events. Would you describe what they are and how they manifest themselves to the end user, the folks who are themselves being hacked? Phishing is one of the most common types of breaches uh, that, that any company or nonprofit is likely to see. Um, it's typically going to take the form of a hacker gaining access to a real employee's uh, email, whether it's a current or former employee, and typically do something like send an email to all other employees with a fake link that they'd like to use to gather uh, private data. Now, this link might look something like a real link, like google.com, but may actually be google.com with three O's and, uh, you know, takes anybody that clicks on it to a completely different web page um, that the hacker owns and controls. So that'd be very typical of a phishing claim. And essentially, it's just any attempt to um, disguise oneself to gain access to uh, a, a company's network or computer system. Social engineering is very similar. I think uh, many people use it synonymously. If it is being used a little bit differently, uh, tends to refer to when hackers are uh, utilizing an, an approach where they know or are gathering specific information about individuals or groups 
um, that will allow them to better manipulate those individuals. Sometimes we hear this called spear phishing or just very targeted phishing. Uh, malware is a very broad term that we use to describe essentially any kind of software uh, that has the intent of being malicious. Uh, so typically it's going to be to steal money or uh, accomplish a ransom scheme, but occasionally it can be also uh, to accomplish political means. Uh, and, and ransomware, finally, is a specific type of malware, and this is the specific type of software that hackers are going to use uh, when they are carrying out a ransomware scheme. It's typically going to be designed by the hacker, and there's a, there's a variety of different means that they can use to get that uh, ransomware onto your system or network. And those ransomware events are the things we hear about in the news, uh, computers being locked up, people having to pay money to get their data back, correct? Typically. Correct. And most importantly, Kieran, based on the types of cyber attacks you just described, what are some essential best practices nonprofits should employ to reduce their risk of a cyber breach event? By far, the single uh, best thing that a nonprofit can do uh, to, to, to bolster their cybersecurity would be to have multi-factor authentication and require that their employees use it uh, for every important application, but especially email, because that's where we see the most phishing come from. Uh, multi-factor authentication, sometimes called dual-factor authentication, is a separate application that uh, you as an organization can have your employees install on their mobile phone typically. Uh, it can be either a phone that you as an organization have provided to them or their own personal phone. They download the multi-factor authentication app on their phone. And then whenever they log into their email or any other important application on their computer or their laptop, it will trigger a notification to their phone or second device that allows them to verify that it was indeed them signing on and not a hacker that had gained access to their password and credentials on the other side of the globe. So we find that this is, like I said, far and away the number one way to best protect yourself against hackers, as well as uh, get yourself access to the best coverages in the insurance world. This is becoming uh, one of the requirements uh, for, for even carrying standalone cyber insurance. Another really, really big thing that uh, organizations can do is to simply have a plan. Uh, this is something that I think can sound really simple, but is very, very important when it comes to a cyber breach, because you just don't know when it's going to happen. And there are a lot of steps involved. Um, there's five or six different services and steps that are considered best practices. Uh, those include things like hiring attorneys to find out what regulation uh, you'll need to comply with and what you'll need to do. Uh, hiring public relations, hiring IT professionals to establish the scope of what occurred. Um, these are all different parties that you'll need to get in contact with. And if you have a plan, if you have contact information for them, uh, it can really streamline the process uh, when there is a potential breach. The last uh, item I really want to highlight is just password hygiene. Um, in the year 2022, computers are extremely powerful. Uh, even small and, and easy to get a hold of ones uh, can do calculations millions of times a second. And so it's it's really starting to make a difference uh, what symbols, letters, numbers comprise a password and how long it is. I'd say the rule of thumb now is to have a password that's 12 digits and use at minimum letters, numbers, and symbols. Uh, to put this in perspective, uh, we would expect the typical password that fits those parameters would take 34,000 years to crack uh, with brute force with a computer. Whereas if you have an eight digit password that utilizes only numbers, a modern computer can typically crack that instantaneously. So it's more important than ever and certainly something that uh, employees should be educated on. That's all very useful information, Kieran. Thank you for joining us today and for sharing your expertise. Thank you for having me here.